Um, so I'd like to welcome to the stage um, with me um, Caroline Donnelly, Director at Denham Capital, uh, Zaino Van Gils, um, who's Investment Analyst at Barrick Fund, uh, Annette Boutonnat, Head of Projects at Dyson Crop Raw Materials, uh, and Stephen Fox, CEO of Veracity Worldwide. And Anthony Maluski, I don't think, is going to be joining with us, uh, my, although my colleague's just checking if he is still around today. So I'd just like to ask very um, uh, quickly um, for a short introduction, um, just briefly around uh, who you are and, and your role, uh, just so the audience knows, because we have a fantastic panel here with a great deal of experience, but everyone's coming at this, uh, uh, this topic um, from, from different perspectives, if you like. So, okay. Caroline. Thanks, Adam. Hi. Is this on? Uh, I'm Caroline Donnelly. I'm a managing director at Denim Capital. We are a $9 billion private equity fund, and we invest in oil and gas, power, and mining. Um, I'm solely involved on the mining side, both North and South America and Africa, and our preference is for later stage projects where we can put in the construction capital and take them through into production. Being a private equity fund, we are long-term investors, um, and then we need to sell. So, you know, we are looking for an exit of our investments. We're not looking to hold them for our grandchildren, as an example. Um, my name is uh, Zina Van Gils. I'm an uh, investment analyst on the uh, metals and mining team uh, for Brock Fund Management based out of London. Um, we've got our so metals and mining team uh, partially situated in London. Uh, we've been doing metals and mining for about four years. Previous to that, uh, Barack is very much focused on agricultural products. Um, and that's sort of where we stem from. Uh, our experience has been in that space. And then uh, as assets under management grew for us, we decided that we had to get into the metals and mining markets. So we focus on debt finance. We will uh, take in small equity kickers um, when required to get our returns to the required level. And we will also offer uh, dynamic hatching solutions which allow our clients to um, have an access to the market. So we connect uh, mostly junior miners um, to, to the market in, uh, may that be China or wherever it's required. And um, we, we do that uh, mostly with a ticket size somewhere between 10 and 100 million. So fairly small ticket, um, but that allows for us to get some quite high returns. Good evening. Try again. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Annette Büttner. I'm working for Thyssen Group. We are part of the big steel maker and industrial group from Germany. But we are a trading company that deals in um, non ferrous metals, uh, ferro alloys, minerals, um, battery materials, magnet materials, solid fuels. Uh, we are interested in long-term agreements, and that's basically my job doing kind of when we do small investments or long-term agreements on the trading side, not the day-to-day -day spot business, which is the main part um, of all of my colleagues who are on the trading side um, in the original um, um, way of doing it. So we are really helping uh, projects getting into production. We get in quite early and uh, try to develop them together with a mining team and uh, yeah, hope then to have a long-term uh, access to supply because as you know, supply is king and without the supply you can't sell anything. I'm Stephen Fox, I'm the CEO of a firm called Veracity based out of New York but also in London and we focus on risk issues essentially above ground in a range of emerging markets. Uh, mining is a top sector for us and we work both with large corporates and then also with financial investors looking inbound at the investment and then on those rare occasions when everything goes wrong and there's a need to figure out how do we fix a problem, we try to come in and help on that front as well. And our ballywick is all the tough stuff, political issues and corruption are the two sets of questions we get asked about more than anything else. Great, thank you. Um, so we've, we've had a pretty positive end to 2017 um, in mining in general. Certainly that was uh, the feeling off the back of some of the one-to-one -one events that uh, we did last year. And it's been a great um, couple of days in, in Cape Town so far 
in terms of the mood of some of the panels and the discussions we've had earlier with the, with investors, um, gold the gold panel was quite optimistic. Base metals um, was quite bullish as well. Um, Caroline, how how would you play the next phase of of, of the market yourself? Um, and could you give us a private equity sort of view on where we might be in that cycle at the moment? Sure, sure. So for you know, for us as, as long-term investors, I think we're, we're pleased to see that the markets have started to come back. It's very difficult to do deals when you're at the bottom of the cycle because nobody wants to look like a complete idiot and sell their asset at that point in time. So, you know, this little bit of momentum has certainly helped. We think it's unlocked assets. We think it's you know, created good opportunities for us in private equity. Um, you know, I think we, we tend, you know, we view the markets, I suppose, like most others, as cyclical we try and look through the cycle. We try not to take bets, on, you know, one-way bets on pricing. Um, we, again, we also try and look at the fundamentals and see whether those make sense to us. You know, it, it's, it's all very tough when you throw all this in the pot together because, frankly, my crystal ball is, you know, no better than anybody else's in the audience. So some of it is a, a gut feel as to what sort of commodities we like. Um, I never tend to be hugely bullish by nature as far as pricing and, and cycles is concerned. You know, I think we could have a little bit more on the upside. I don't see a huge correction though, you know, but I didn't see a huge correction in the, in the S&P and look what happened over the last couple of days. So, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't place much reliance on my forecasting. Um, for us at Denim, we like, the, we like the base metal side of the business. Uh, we like make coal. We'll get involved in some of the speciality businesses, um, but really those are on an extremely targeted um, basis. Okay, fantastic. And Zainan, how about yourself? Um, well, for us, I think uh, one thing that's, that's very important is that we need to focus on, on how long we see this run going on. And to put a figure on that, I mean, it's almost impossible. Uh, if, if we did that, we'd just become a hedge fund and we'd sell or buy and do that. But I think for us, importantly, is that we, we try to pick assets which can work under any um, market condition. Um, and if we do get into a specific asset where we think there's some future risk, um, which often happens when we go into something with a slightly more short-term view because we provide both structured trade finance, which obviously will, will go no longer than 180 days. Um, if we do that, we will try to hedge um, whatever uh, position that we have in the market uh, and make sure that we, we're not exposed to that. And that is if we finance a, an offtake or something like that. If we um, go in on a slightly longer term basis, so if we say do a, a mezzanine or a senior debt play uh, with one of our other funds, um, we do tend to focus on, on, on the asset being something which can work under any environment. Um, for us personally, I think we've, we've got a, a strong cycle which is obviously supported by, by Trump in the US and uh, China not collapsing as everyone sort of expected. Um, and I think that's going to go forward and uh, I think we've got about 18 months left in this and I don't know how much higher it's going to go. We are, we're quite confident on, on base metals. I think ferrous is, is very strong at the moment. I don't know how much longer that can go. Um, precious metals is, is very dependent on the political situation changing. Uh, and, and obviously we'll, we'll have a large impact on, uh, on the side of, of the US with the rate hikes coming up this year. Um, so I think around that there will be some insecurities, but generally we're, we're still quite bullish uh, on the metal side. Um, and that, I, yeah, sorry. What please. you mentioned, um, saying one has to work under all, all circumstances and all, uh, yeah, whatever happens, you have to be able to continue with the project. I think that is uh, a main focus for us as well. We try to structure projects in a way that they, that we and the, the miner can survive even in difficult uh, situations because the cycle goes up and down. And now it's quite nice. Okay, you make better margins, but it will you don't know how fast it will go down again. So actually I'm similar to, um, to Caroline, not very bullish because um, in trading we've seen so many things happening and we've seen um, governments changing regulations suddenly from one day to the next and uh, things just happen and you have to be able to kind of continue and uh, make a living from, from this kind of uh, business. And uh, yeah, so actually you have to be flexible. I think 
this is the most important. You have to be agile. You have to mitigate risk in working with different raw materials. You can't just put your, all your bets on one uh, raw material. And um, apart from that, I mean, you just have to kind of try and uh, structure the, the agreements as good as you can because long term always means that you also have to compete to China and that you have to be competitive to Chinese prices. Um, sometimes it just comes down to that. And uh, yeah, we, we don't want uh, one year projects or people who have to close their minds and their plans again. We want to have a cycle uh, up and down uh, that everybody survives. Mm. So not getting too carried away then at the, mo at the moment. Okay, um, Stephen, what's your sort of take on the markets at the moment and how does that interplay with um, your risk advisory? I'm sure. Well, I want to be a perpetual enthusiast, but I, I try to be a realist. And so I, I look at it in two ways. At one level, there is a theme across many of the markets where all of you will be considering investing and the dreaded words resource nationalism, which Annette referred to. And I, I think you have a couple of stunning examples recently, Tanzania being highest on that list highly problematic and certainly the remarks that came from certain folks from the DRC yesterday at the, the other event were, um, were not in a positive direction. At the same time, you do see notable exceptions of countries that are moving in the right direction and we like to say in some ways have drunk the Kool-Aid and are trying to do everything possible to encourage investment and to move away from that trend. We can come back to those in a second. So I would say mixed. Uh, at a base level, no pun intended on base metals, but at a base level, some worry about resource nationalism. On the positive front, a couple of countries moving in an absolutely correct direction, having seen the troubles in their neighbors and how much discouragement that has caused to certain investments and destruction of value. Fantastic. And uh, well, we can dwell on some of those countries countries now, if you like. What, what were some are some of the regions that you um, or jurisdictions that you see have perhaps improved or are showing perhaps a more favourable risk climate, if you like, less sure. sovereign risk? So let's start with some good news on that front. Um, the one that had been described to me by someone as a backwater of mining previously, the Ivory Coast actually goes into our most improved category, and while that's mainly gold assets. Uh, I think the important part is an attitude and an openness of government, and in particular the minister who gets it and wants to do everything possible to encourage mining companies to come in and get projects done. But I think that also draws on a theme that big infrastructure heavy projects are really challenging to get done. And the question may not be what is the project itself, but what is the infrastructure component in terms of assessing the likelihood of success in that project. So prime case in point in a place that we know extremely well having worked on the Simandu issues in iron ore for over seven years is in Guinea, which was a massive requirement for infrastructure and for a variety of reasons never got off the ground. But if you look at Guinea today as a mining jurisdiction, actually things are working pretty well and a host of bauxite projects and smaller iron ore have taken root and are actually now producing. So I think that that bodes well. Um, right where we're sitting here in South Africa, at the topmost national level, things probably couldn't have gotten any worse uh, than they were. There seems to be a potential for great change coming with the new president that will arrive on the scene, but the journey between now and where it goes could be a very tough one. So again, it's a country by country. Um, and then let's come to Tanzania, which has been, as I mentioned earlier, real destruction of value in the Acacia experience there has not been uh, a happy one and has sent really um, worrying signals to those interested in uh, Tanzania. So some positive spots, some negative, and I could go on at much greater length, but let me stop there. No, f f fair enough, and some, uh, some of the key highlights there. Zeno, your, your Barrack Fund is Africa-focused. Um, do you, how, how much do you read into the jurisdictional risks of when you're assessing companies or trades or commodities that you're interested in? Um, is there a restriction there that you, you, you have to um, uh, adhere to? Absolutely. I mean, look, we've obviously got uh, country-specific limits uh, which are in place uh, on every fund. Um, and that is really just to, uh, to mitigate that risk that one country from one day to another could turn around and, and really, pardon my French, screw you over. Uh, and I think for us, something that's very important is that we, again, look at are we going into this short-term or long-term? And if you're going into something short-term, you're able to uh, take a lot more risks 
uh, in, the, in the place that you're going to. And you can say, look, I'm, I'm going to give this country a shot. I don't see it going bad in the next six months. But it's very likely that a country in Africa will go bad within three years. And we've seen it happen times and times again. <laughs> I mean, well, <laughs> actually even less. But, um, but I think we, we see that and we see, we've seen it with DRC turning around in, in two seconds over the last um, yeah, week where basically we've, we've come from a point where we, were, we came with a plan to Indaba of looking specifically for deals in DRC to pursue. And the last week has, has turned that upside down and now we're going to South Africa. Um, so I think it's, uh, it's, it's really, it's, it's such a short term environment. It's very difficult to mitigate it, but we try to mitigate it with the best of our knowledge. And then obviously we bring in political risk insurance whenever possible, uh, even though that might sometimes decrease your returns a tiny bit. For us having relatively high returns in general, we are usually able to, to live with that. Uh, cuts in profits um, to be able to sleep safely at night. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Annette, you yeah. look like you wanted to jump I in on that. I also think it's very difficult to mitigate that kind of risk because when you're somewhere long term, I mean, it can be Asia, it can be South America, it can be Africa, things change and they change suddenly. And we've seen that in the case of Tanzania, where for 10 years everybody said it's a great country and it's one of the few stable countries. Just look at the region, but Tanzania, that is a good one. and. Then one day to the next, things suddenly changed. So, um, I mean, there are really limits to what you can, can do. You can carefully look at the project. I'm really of your opinion, it's important not to have too much money on the ground. So the, the bigger the project, of naturally, the more the risk for the guys who have invested, but um, also for, for some government getting interested in that project. So actually it should be, we are looking mainly at mid-size or even smaller projects because um, they tend to be more careful in government relations as well. If you're a real big player, like, um, yeah, just a real big one, um, sometimes people think they're kind of um, at the same level as the, as the government in that country and that never works because that always creates um, disharmony and, uh, and problems later. So. From my opinion, uh, smaller or mid-sized projects are more careful in government relations, and that's very, very important. Okay. Um, I would just contrast that on the smaller and more careful. I actually, and this may be sacrilegious to say here, but I think most junior mining companies and the smaller ones don't pay careful attention at all to the political issues in the environment from the scene, only when there's a problem and there's very little homework done and the sort of stakeholder analysis that you need to make things happen. And the downside of that is that those companies will eventually be bought by a larger player who will look at those questions and say, what are we inheriting here? And apply a discount to the price. Or if there's a private equity investment, they will say, how much baggage is there that's come, whether it's the provenance or the stakeholder engagement issues, which I do yeah. think are critical. You have, to, you have to select your partners carefully. <laughs> so yes. so Man management teams are critical. Yeah, you have to. Uh, I've sat as a judge on the battery metals presentations yesterday and one, t one guy got up and said, there's our DRC expert and it was one guy and it literally the team was three guys of which one was the DRC expert. That's really not going to fly. You know, if you're, if you're going to go into the somewhat more tougher jurisdictions, you actually need the right people on the ground. You need to have well-developed networks and you need to be able to explain that to the investors as to should things go wrong, how you plan to engage more with governments, communities, you know, the environmental permitting agencies, all those, you know, all those factors of the business, which whilst aren't an integral portion of, well, does my project make money and how much money do I need in order to get it there, are very much a factor in can I actually even do anything with this project in the first place. You know, as a fund manager, we look on the basis of a risk return, um, risk return profile. So when we are going into slightly harder jurisdictions, of which I, which I will admit we did not think Tanzania was one up until recently, um, you know, we view it on a risk return basis. Are we being adequately compensated for the risk that we're taking in our returns? But factored into that, of course, is what's our entry price? You know, so when, when we look at junior mining companies or we look at projects, we are also looking at what's it actually going to cost us to get in. It's not just a case of how much does this project make, it's 
you know, if the markets are super frothy and we're coming in at a high valuation, you know, then we need a proper return on top of what we paid to get in in order to adequately compensate us for that risk. Um, and so that, you know, that for us is a critical way of, of looking, at, looking at the industry. So you're almost setting a risk premium uh, country to country or, or case, case by case? It's more on a case by case basis. We don't, you know, we don't have country limits as such, such as um, the Barack guys do. Right. Uh, very much we assess it on a case by case. We don't do that many projects that it, you know, is worth our while to go out and assess a number of countries. Um, so it is, you know, more opportunity driven as to which countries we'd want to go into, and then we try and figure out how much exposure we really want in those countries. I think uh, just one point which I would like to make on the side as well, for us coming in as investors, uh, we tend to try to be able to help with that political side of things. So, for example, if a, if a junior miner has been operating in a country and he's not built up the best of uh, political relationships, as you said, they just sort of ignore it. Because oftentimes, I mean, these guys will be uh, miners who've found one specific project, they've worked in it for five years, but they, I mean, they, they know mining, right? So they, they don't look at politics, and they, it's, not their, it's not their play. And then for us, it's important to come in, and in, in some countries where we know that we have done business previously and where we know the political situation and we, we are able to assist, we will try and come in and be that connection to the politicians or to the political side of things and, and assist on that basis. That's, that sounds fairly hands-on, fairly close to the management teams. Is that is that how you like to work with them? Is yeah, they're quite particular? dirty. <laughs> <laughs> now we try to get in, get engaged as, as much as we can. Yeah, I mean, I think you'll find with most private equity, we are. Yeah. I like to tell people we're annoyingly hands-on. Yeah. Um, it kind of comes with the territory, especially a fund like ours, which is majority positions, controlling stakes. We provide the vast amount of the money. Like we expect to know what's going on, and you know, if we need to be if we need to be involved, we will be involved. Um, we will, you know, it's pretty rare that we tell our management teams how to operate the technical side of their business, but we certainly are not shy in pointing out gaps in the executive and where skills are missing and, you know, where we think things could be done better or could be done differently. And, and coming on to that, perhaps, we, so let's focus in on the, on the m management teams of the juniors. We've had a lot of companies here, a lot of presenting um, some good projects, but what would you say are some of the key characteristics that um, people might need to change or be aware of, um, some lessons learned perhaps from the last uh, up cycle that um, mining... <laughs> how long do we have, <laughs> We have. <laughs> and how much do people really want to hear? <laughs> um, the headline stuff, the key bugs Head for you. Headline that. stuff. Yeah. If you say you're going to do something, please have the skills and expertise to go out and do it. So the amount of teams that pitch me and say, we're going to construct this because we're developers and then we're going to mine it. And I look at it and I say, well, how many of you have ever built a mine before? Um, and everyone looks around, like that is not a good start. <laughs> you know, please have your skills and experience at least match what it is you say you're going to do. I mean, that is like, for us, that's the first port of call on a management team. Yep. Um, you know, and then we, we also want to see that the management team is a, invested and B, aligned. So, you know, we typically look for both the carrot and the stick approach. You know, I have that in my job. I have invest and I'm, you know, hopefully get an incentive if things go well. We'd like to see the same in the management teams. We don't want to see it as a free option and we come in and provide all the capital. So, you know, we're looking for teams that have been out there and at least done something vaguely similar before and, you know, are trying to repeat what they've done once before. And B, we, you know, we want the teams to be aligned with us as an investor. Mm. So, you know, did you have any, anything in particular? Um, no, I, I think I mostly box? agree with you. I mean, for us, management teams are so much more important in many cases than the assets because you've had top assets that have gone absolutely nowhere because of terrible management teams. And you've had horrible assets which have managed to turn some sort of a small profit because the management team in place was, was a great one. And therefore, I mean, it, it goes very strongly into our due diligence uh, that when we look at an asset, when we look at a project, we will, we will constantly bug people about what have they done before and we'll go asking completely around the entire market, do you know these people, what have they done, have you worked with them? 
um, how do they perform, how have they performed in the past, and I think that it's very important to focus on that because uh, we, we over-underestimate uh, the, the asset which people are and which management teams are. Mm. Annette, how do you weigh up assets versus management team experience so they um, of equal yeah, consideration for you? Pretty similar. I mean, if you have a geologist and some public relations guy, it's usually um, <laughs> troublesome and you have to put y yourself a lot of work in and it's not sure if it's really uh, going to work right. because you need people with different skills and you also need to add these skills at a certain time. I mean, you usually start with a geologist, that's totally fine. But um, then you need somebody who knows of economics and logistics and you need to have some serious people behind it who've done mining before or maybe um, are even part of a bigger group that makes it of course much easier. Um, it's really, really important to have good people on the ground or th to have the will also from the shareholder side um, in such a, a, a project, junior mining company, to change people in the management team. And that I've seen is something that is rarely done, but it would be highly important at some projects. And uh, yeah, that delays projects and in the end kills projects because a lot of the management teams can really um, live quite comfortably being lifestyle juniors, like never getting into production. But um, of course that's nothing um, that a fund wants or like us traders wants because we need material and product. And uh, therefore, the, the interests do not always align. So um, for us, it's really important that uh, the will is there to become a, a mine and a production facility and uh, yeah, to get the hands dirty. And um, it's rather difficult um, judging people in the beginning on their real will of, of doing that. Mm. So track record yeah. is very important there, no doubt. Um, Stephen, so uh, you had a few comments about junior mines, but you didn't go into the specifics about the sort of risks that you're seeing. Tell us what the sort of the key. Maybe that's key. a good segue into the question. So uh, a rather famous investor who all of you would know, and I, I haven't met personally, but I certainly followed Robert Friedland. He made the observation that the asset is more important than the jurisdiction. And I'm going to argue with you that I think he may have been right in the past, but in today's world, that's not the case. In order to realize that asset, I think you need two ingredients of success before you get to the finance component. Clearly the right management team, and then a deep understanding of the jurisdiction, and that takes the asset as a, a given. That's the geologist to figure out. But how do you take a great asset and ensure that it becomes a profitable and realizable asset over the long term? And you do that by having an understanding of what are the jurisdiction issues that are there, what does the marketplace care about, and then what are the skill sets as my fellow panelists have just been talking about to actually transform the success factors that you need to operate. So what would those success factors be? And I think it's looking at an understanding at the national government level, being able to understand who are the key stakeholders that are there, what's the competitive environment that you're dealing with, what type of local interactions are you having, and then, unfortunately, the corruption issue is one that people need to be very aware of. And the country I would watch on that front, where there's going to be a lot of news coming on the corruption front, particularly from a US vantage point, won't surprise you in the slightest, but is going to be the DRC in Congo. And it's coming from the US in a sense that they're looking at um, being more competitive on their own battery well, I metals think production? There's a genuine desire to, even though it was first implemented in 1977, to finally implement US law but also to create a level playing field and to say this is values driven, but is also driven of unfair practices will not be appropriate or, or yep. tolerated. And then using an extra, you can argue all day long whether that's right or wrong, but I would argue to you, sort of like wearing a seat belt in a car, it's part of the way the world is today. And I feel that there are a lot of people in the mining world, in big mining, I think that gospel has been taken up. In mid and junior mining, it's still early stage in that process. In the mining investment world, I think it's very varied depending on where the investor is coming from, how seriously they take corruption issues. But I suspect it's going to become a lot more serious if we look out to the next five to 10 years. Well, we can go to jail as directors and equity investors, so we take it very seriously. So, yeah, that was you know, a I think, I, Yeah, I think to, to your point there, Stephen, f the other item which is critical for us, which revolves around all those points you mentioned, is we want to see local management teams 
you know, we, I mean, love all the Canadians, love all the Aussies. We don't want to see Aussies and Canadians flying in and flying out. You know, we actually want to see people who understand the environment, who live in the country, and we want to see them as an integral portion of the team, not, you know, three layers down on the uh, organogram, but actually in the C-suite, part of the team with responsibilities, you know, in order to make sure that, you know, we have a better handle on all those items that you mentioned around the local politics and communities. Can I make a 15 second observation on that that I think you're absolutely on the, there were two projects in Burkina Faso that I'm aware of and in one project, the local team was a strong part of management and was close to and everybody in the team in the canteen, local and expatriate, ate together at every meal. There was a second project where there were no senior local staff and they ate in two separate dining rooms. Which do you think was the more successful of those two projects? Um, I can tell you the answer on that one very easily. The integrated. So uh, how many sort of levels between top management and C-suite you, you, you mentioned? Uh, you want uh, the, need, the local management team needs to be an integral portion of the C-suite. Yeah. You can't do it any other way. You can't, you know, you can't sort of delegate down your you know, local government relations and your community relations. That, that to us is a recipe for disaster. Um, we've got about a minute or two left. Uh, is there anyone got any questions that they'd like to ask the panel? We can whip a microphone around quickly. This one down here. Just wondering, there's a lot of companies here. Are there any that you are involved in that are here at One to One that you've uh, invested in? I think, uh, Annette, you may have, is it Rainbow Rare Earths? I think I mentioned that they have a, an agreement with you, which uh, I thought looked very interesting. That, that you have a relationship that you guys have got either shareholdings or you've you've done deals with that are presenting here companies that you've particularly got a relationship with. Yeah, I think Rainbow Rare Earths did present um, uh, earlier today. Actually, yeah, they but mentioned they had a thing with Tyson Crook. We're the off takers for Rainbow Rare Earths. Off takers, yeah. yeah. You are. Yeah. We're not invested, but, but we are the off takers. Yeah, and, but I'm just wondering if there's any other companies here that you've um, you've done deals with. Don't um, think on our side any of our companies are yeah, here. There are quite some people here, but uh, there are also confidentiality agreements, etc. So, um, I think though that uh, Caroline, obviously, uh, Rob Still from Pangea is one of your uh, investee uh, companies. Yeah. So, uh, well, we've actually also got some relationships with them, but there's, I mean, there's a lot of junior miners here, so I haven't got the list in my head, unfortunately. Yeah. Our, our, our largest event in terms of total number of junior miners, we had 84 um, participants, which is great. And More than in Dalva, is that right? Um, not, not entirely sure their numbers. We did, we, we, we were busy here, but, but, um, but I think it's a good sign for the industry, perhaps. But also um, something that um, you know, are they all going to be successful? Um, it, perhaps that's something we could sort of end, end, end a note on. If you had sort of one salient point for the management teams here, what would your message be for the year ahead for 2018? Be able to articulate your investment thesis in two sentences. Why it is investors should invest in your company and what it is they're going to be achieving by investing in your company. In two sentences, not in 25 PowerPoint slides, <laughs> in two sentences. So we'll have a two minute pitches next, next year rather than a 10 minute company presentations. <laughs> okay. I think that's actually a very good point because I'm doing that uh, panel at Indaba at the moment. So <laughs> some of the presentations are very interesting. Um, but I think uh, what is very important is that people uh, focus during this time of the cycle, which, I mean, either it's on the way up or we're close to the top, uh, people don't go crazy. I mean, if you now go and you look at uh, copper projects that work at about 7,000, it, it just it's not reasonable so don't be ridiculous in your approaches um, stay on the ground and, and focus on on what's realistic and what can work in the long term be, a re be realistic in your timeline I mean we are not stupid we know when you change again and again and again so it's <laughs> like um, well just be realistic be um, yeah somebody we can uh, have confidence in and deliver Stephen? On the delays okay. front, I think that's very typical and you need to build that into your timelines that depending where you are, it's going to be a part. But uh, my summary would just be simply two words, think holistically and look at all the different aspects as you're taking a project forward. Fantastic. Well, there you have it. Um, sort of 
clarity and uh, succinctness and, uh, and thinking of the long, long term and transparency as well. Um, I'd like to say a round of applause for our panellists, please.